over to you, Helen. Okay. Thank you. Yes, with one hour's notice. So, um, uh, so forgive me. And and oh, yeah, as, as Ashley has said, we I realise that I'm not a majority world scholar, and so I feel um, you know somewhat um, I'm intruding to some extent. But forgive me, and I hope that this will be um, something that is of global relevance. Um, so this is a talk I gave um a little while ago and it does talk quite a lot about international issues i'm aware or well, i realized in the hour that i had to look at it that most of them are not majority world but i'm hoping that there will be themes that will be of relevance so i'd like to begin um, by showing you a very short video which is i think three minutes long and this was produced by popular q anon conspiracy theorist matthew scarborough in the time, I notice the chronology of this, it's important, in the time between the Capitol riots and the inauguration of um, Biden. So bear that dating in mind as you watch this. The time for excuses is over. Now is the time for strength. If you want peace, you must stand strong at all times. The time for empty talk is over. Now arrives the hour of action. Today, you end one chapter, but you are about to begin the greatest adventure of your life. January 20 will be remembered as the day the people became the rulers of this nation again. If the righteous many do not confront the wicked few, then evil will triumph. You came by the tens of millions to become part of a historic movement, the likes of which the world has never seen before. Now we are calling for a great reawakening. When decent people and nations become bystanders to history, the forces of destruction only gather power and strength. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. Do not underestimate us and do not try us. This would be a fatal miscalculation. It is not which party controls our government, but whether our government is controlled by the people. There should be no fear. We are protected. We will be protected by God. I know that each of you will be a warrior for the truth, will be a warrior for our country and for your family. I know that each of you will do what is right, not what is the easy way. Our answer will be a rebirth of devotion to defeat the enemies of humanity. This is a very different administration. Oh, it stopped. Never mind. I think you'd probably got the gist. Um, you'll have noticed, I think, the mingling of political and religious themes with both explicit and implicit reference to the Bible. And these include theme narratives of righteousness and peace, courage and strength against impending evil, holy war, revival and rebirth. The film's use of imagery and language evokes recollections of scriptural texts to um, cos cosmic eschatological battle, a theme dear to the hearts of many white American evangelicals. Such texts speak of the final battle between good and evil, of the dragon and the beast who will wage war against the lamb, that is Jesus and his saints. And so in the world portrayed by this video, there's a polarization into the wicked few, Democrats and liberals, described as forces of destruction and bringers of carnage, and the righteous many, the warriors for the truth, mainly white Trump supporters with particular care to highlight happy nuclear families. Terrifying as this film is, it is by no means unique. You may have heard, let me hope the PowerPoint hasn't frozen, PowerPoint has frozen, bear with me. Uh, you may have heard um, about how Mike Pence uh, misquoted the book of Hebrews. Let me try and reshare my screen. In the United States. Sorry, right. Okay. 
Sorry, playing a video on PowerPoint is just too technical for me. Right. Okay, good. Uh, so you may have heard about how my, Mike Pence misquoted the book of Hebrews at a campaign rally. Reports of this quotation often stop too soon, because if we listen carefully to what he said, we'll notice how he not only switches out the name of Jesus for old glory, which refers to the American flag, but then goes on to bring Jesus back in. In other words, he's implying that worship of the Lord and worship of the flag of the American nation are the same. This is what he says. Let's run the race marked out for us. Let's fix our eyes on old glory and all she represents. Let's fix our eyes on this land of heroes and let their courage inspire. Let's fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith and freedom and never forget that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. In the highly choreographed setting of a campaign rally and in the mouth of a self-avowed church-going evangelical, this is no accidental misspeak. And such Christian nationalism is seen at grassroots level too. I'm hoping here now I've got three screen grabs from social media selected to show the tight association in many American minds between patriotism and God. Ah, oh, there's it. That was the quotation I was looking for from Mike Pence, but I've read that to you now. Here we go. Uh, so the first, this one makes a blasphemous association between the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ crucified, the American flag and the gun. This is a screen grab taken during Trump's presidency in response to his bout with COVID-19. Notice the religious, almost messianic language being used of Trump. Notice the capitalized pronouns used to describe him. Notice how MAGA and our men are symmetrically arranged, flanking the American flag. But easy as it is sometimes to lob a verbal grenade across the Atlantic, this phenomenon is not confined to the USA. In recent years, we've been seeing an alarming rise of far-right nationalism sweeping across many parts of the world too. Some of these nationalist parties are operating at the political fringe, but others have become mainstream parties and some have even been elected to power. Key to the rhetoric of many of these movements is the idea of restoring a Christian nation. And this is accompanied by an alarming commingling of religious and national language. Rise up, O Lord, and may thy enemies be dispersed and may those who hate thee be driven from thy face. These words from Psalm 67 were placed at the top of a chapter in the 1500 page manifesto of Anders Breivik. And Breivik, you may recall, went on to murder 77 people, mainly teenagers, in Oslo, and Utoya Island in 2011. And his manifesto also stated this, you can either choose to learn how to rise up in the power of your Lord and Saviour and learn how to become a true warrior in the Lord, or you can continue to keep your head in the sand and oppressor after oppressor keep beating you down. That's Norway. We can move to Hungary. In Hungary, Viktor Orban has positioned himself, that's him on the left, as the defender of Christianity against a dangerous influx of Islam arriving with refugees from the Middle East. He says this, the masses arriving from other civilizations endanger our way of life, our culture, our customs and our Christian traditions. Or Spain. Here, the far-right populist movement Vox is led by Santiago Abascal. Here he is, kissing the tomb of the near-fascist dictator Francisco Franco. Abascal, who models himself on Orban of the previous slide, is on record as saying this. Our identity and that of the whole of Europe is Christian, and that must be preserved because our values are superior and dignify man. I do not want the Islamization of Europe because it goes against who we are against the best of us. Or Greece, as the influence of this Christian nationalism has grown across Europe, the Christian faith has been used as an excuse for resisting migrancy, sometimes violently. This is a screen grab from a couple of years ago where the inhabitants of the Greek island of Lesbos, which admittedly has been hugely and disproportionately affected by the migrant crisis, were seen pushing a boat of refugees back out to sea with the cry, we are Christians here, you are not welcome. 
This image is reportedly, this image is reportedly of an Orthodox priest patrolling the Greek Turkish border prepared to repel with violence the refugees who were attempting to cross it. In the UK, we've seen far fewer of such excesses in recent times, but it is important that we don't imagine that we are immune to them. The two figures seen here, Paul Golding and Jada Franson, are the leaders of the far right party Britain First. They've both served time in prison for hate crimes. They make a habit of parading through predominantly Muslim areas, brandishing the cross, proclaiming that Britain is a Christian nation and that Muslims, even British born ones, should get out. And the mainstream party UKIP uses similar language of a Christian nation. Nigel Farage has called for a muscular defence of Christian heritage and claims that or claimed that UKIP is the only major political party left in Britain which cherishes its Judeo-Christian heritage. And for those who were on the in the conference last night, our keynote speaker Matthew Feldman works um, extensively within the UK looking at far right groups um, and he's an expert witness in, um, in trials of far right nationalists. Um, and some of the things that I think he has to deal with make his hair stand on end. Far right wing organisations tend to emphasise the form rather than the beliefs of religions. But it cannot be denied that there are elements of right wing ideology which might appear to be endorsed by the Bible. This can be problematic for the church. How are local churches to counter narratives of hate and othering if they feel that their own sacred text might be lending support to the ideology? So what I'd like to do uh, is to identify some elements of nationalistic ideology and we'll then take a closer look at some of the relevant biblical themes in order to test the question of whether the Bible and in particular the Old Testament does indeed support such ideology. Now because nationalist far-right movements are quite heterogeneous it's rather risky to attempt sweeping statements about their ideology or organisation. Almost everything one says can be, can be um, find a counter example. But in order to say anything meaningful, it's going to be important to make some generalizations. So let me begin by offering some definitions. Nationalism is an ideology that focuses on the nation or the state. And there are two types. First, there is civic nationalism. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, this is an inclusive sort of nationalism. It focuses on the autonomy of the nation and it's interested in the unity and identity of the nation's legal population. But also there is ethnic nationalism, which focuses on a particular group within a nation state. Ethnic nationalism identifies that group as the true population of the nation, irrespective of the legal status of others. This form of nationalism is likely to cause violence and to destroy community cohesion, and is tied up with far-right ideology and outright extremism. Nationalistic groups across Europe are quite varied in their approach to religion. They may be pagan, secular, or hitch their wagon to a variety of religions. But our question today is, what is it about the Christian faith or about Christian culture that makes it so useful to ethnic nationalists? Chillingly, one outright blogger recently described Christianity as being infinitely malleable. He said this, once the outright achieves fame and success, Christians will be quick to line up behind it. This is fairly typical of the outright, which tends to instrumentalize Christian symbols and tropes. It likes to deploy cultural memories rather than offer genuine theological engagement. Nevertheless, as we've seen, the narrative is plausible enough to gain traction within elements of the church in parts of Europe and the USA. Religious code words are chosen by the outright to appeal to believers, and there is a genuine danger that the church will be co-opted to their ideological agenda. And broadly, I think there are four key areas where the Christian story can be exploited to appear to support ethnic nationalism. First, far right movements often promote a moral cleanup, a push against drugs or street crime or against what is viewed as deviant sexual practice. It's easy and cheap to invoke the Christian scriptures to this end. And this is a tantalizing offer to many Christians. Maybe it's possible to gain power over legal decision making, to straighten out the nation's morality. These things might be viewed as a desirable prize. But what would be the cost? What Faustian bargain would be necessary? 
What does it profit a church if it gains the whole world but loses its soul? A key question to consider here is who gets to set the moral compass of a nation? If we outsource that to the government, we'll spend all our time trying to bend that government to our will. And though the right of the government to declare and determine what true morality is may suit our purpose when we Christians have the upper hand, we cannot be sure that that will always be the case. Might should not be what defines what is right. But if we truly believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ has something infinitely precious to offer the world, then we must believe it can stand on its own merit and without the use of coercion. Secondly, as we've seen, the rise of ethnic nationalism is accompanied by resistance to immigration, particularly immigration by peoples of different ethnicity. Immigrants then may be viewed as a threat to the Christian culture and heritage of the receiving country. This is because of a close association in, the, in their minds, between, in, in the outright's minds, between Christianity and the white native population. Of course, to conflate Christianity with whiteness is a grave error indeed, not least because its founder was a Middle Eastern man. Of course, the typical Christian these days is an African woman. So by what cultural arrogance might we imagine that our particular brand of Christianity is the norm? Whatever our view on freedom of movement and immigration, the argument must be made on other grounds than religious ones. There's good evidence, I think, that immigration brings a net benefit to a society when managed well. But be that as it may, we should not invoke a notional Christian culture to resist it. A third component of far right movements typically involves a charismatic authoritarian figure often referred to as a strong man. This leader will represent himself as being a man of the people, a man of action who is not afraid to take difficult decisions and make bold, decisive choices. This is often accompanied by strongly gendered language and sexual stereotyping. Many of these far right groups champion so-called traditional roles for women. And there's a lot of overlap between these far right ideologies and what's known as the manosphere, which is a loose network of online forums marked by misogyny and sometimes hate speech. Some wings of the church resonate with this as they consider these typical these traditional gender roles to be representative of so-called biblical manhood and womanhood. But of course, Christians follow a crucified saviour, a non-toxic man who did not start with power or glory, or sorry, he did not strut with power or glory in his masculinity. This was tweeted by a very prominent Christian pastor and writer, probably most of you will know his name. It's hard to escape the conclusion that the words, is there anyone like unto him, of course, referring to Trump, must self-consciously reflect the King James Bible, who is like unto the Lord our God. When the church is tempted to get caught up in the cult of personality, it should remember, it declares there is no one good but God alone. And the fourth feature is what is known as exceptionalism. This is a form of national self-identity where a nation views itself as specially commissioned by God for the blessing of the world. It often manifests as superiority over other nations and a sense of self-congratulation often accompanied by blindness to its own moral defects. Sometimes exceptionalism is framed theologically. In the United States, there's something called the myth of manifest destiny based upon the founding father's belief that America had a particular role in God's purposes. The idea of America being the new Israel has long been in the political mainstream. Presidents John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, Barack Obama and others have all referred to the United States as a city on a hill. In fact, the language was used at the recent presidential inauguration. Today, this language is being echoed by the American outright. Bear with me, I have lost a page of my notes, which I guess won't matter too much, but I will have to just, okay, keep going. I think actually what I might do there, Ashley, is pause. I've got a second half, which kind of gives a, um, a sort of biblical response or picks up on some of these biblical themes, but that might be enough uh, for our discussion. I'll, leave, I'll see, see what you say. Uh, it, 
It, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly happy to leave it there. If you are, I am sure there can be plenty of discussion out of just this.